I'm Robert LeBoyer, Senior Biotechnology Analyst at Novo Capital. And with me here today is Dr. Shekhar Musanuri, Chairman and CEO of Ocugen. Ocugen is a company developing gene therapy products for ocular diseases. And one of the things about Ocugen that I found when I started coverage three years ago was that Ocugen has a different approach to gene therapy. I've known many companies that were looking at a single mutated gene and seeking to replace that defective gene with a functional copy to produce a protein that was lacking and causing symptoms and a disease state. Ocugen is taking a different approach and looking at a regulatory gene that controls pathways and gene networks so that they can treat diseases where multitudes of genes are affected. And in many states, it's not a single gene, it's a series of genes and a gene pathway. So here to tell us about that is Dr. Musanuri. Would you like to give us a little background and discuss some of the diseases that you're treating in clinical trials? Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Labori. Thank you for having me today. Uh, absolutely. So what we are working on is a modifier gene therapy platform targeting um, ocular diseases, mostly focused on retina, which are blindness diseases. And uh, so these modifier genes, um, they have ability to, they're like master regulators. And uh, they, they have ability to control the functional network in retina from cell development, metabolism, inflammation to survival. And they reset the homeostasis at a molecular level and cellular level and, and restore the function and also create healthy environment for cells to survive. Why that's important? I mean, if you take uh, photoreceptors um, in retina, you know, they're the ones who absorb the light and they transmit the electric signal to the brain so we can see that, you know, that's how you see the vision, that's how the vision works. And if the photoreceptors, um, you know, if in a traditional um, approach is, just like you stated, you have a non-functioning gene, you give a functioning gene, and uh, then you know, when you start expressing the protein and you control the disease progression, however, you're assuming your system is okay. A lot of times when you have a defect uh, based on epigenetics, you may have cascading effect, which is impacting the system. And so you really need to look at the entire system as holistic approach, uh, not single gene mutation. The second issue with the traditional approach, when you take diseases, in the eye space, such as retinitis pigmentosa, you know, it has got over 100 genes which can mutate and cause the disease. And if you take the approach, traditional approach, you need more than 100 products to treat these patients. And uh, in US itself, we have more than 100,000 patients, 1.6 million global. Many of these patients do become legally blind at some part of their life. And so they're really desperately seeking, uh, you know, rescue. Why? Even some of them, you know, the disease is uh, so debilitating, they start losing their peripheral vision and, uh, and night vision first. They have central vision left. Eventually, they lose that. So whatever the disease state they are in, let's say they lost some of the, um, you know, peripheral vision and night vision, they have some central vision left. They're still independent and semi-independent. And if you can protect or preserve what they have, that will be phenomenal, right? So that's where we come in. So they cannot expect companies to develop 100 products to take care of all these patients globally. So the modifier genes, as I explained before, since they control the, the functional network and all underlying gene expressions and uh, ability to reset the homeostasis and restore the function. So these genes can target potentially all these patients, you know, all these um, uh, genes which have defects, you know, more than 100 for RP. And that will be big because, you know, so at least, you know, there's a hope for these patients. And uh, we have um, good data we generated in phase one, two. And based on that, you know, we got RMAT designation from FDA, Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy. And uh, we got a green light to move into phase three. And so um, the phase three trial actually targets gene agnostic, um, you know, with a broader indication RP. And that's what we're targeting. And recently, we also announced EMA-aligned. Uh, with our U.S. approach, and uh, they have um, 
agreed that we don't need an additional trial in Europe. We can submit the US data for market authorization. That's a big plus. Why? You know, because these are the um, regulatory agencies in US and EMA that will allow us to globally, you know, go very deeply, um, you know, whenever we get approvals to launch this product and help these patients. That's our plan. Yeah, and you just summarized several years of progress in just a few sentences. But in your phase one, two trial, one of the things that, that I found interesting was that you were preserving vision and actually improving the vision. This wasn't just something that slows the deterioration to blindness. These patients actually improved and can see more than they did before the trial. So there you're pre, you're not just preserving sight, you're actually improving the disease state, which I thought was very significant. And the FDA giving you that RMAT designation, which allows for increased guidance and accelerated approval, agrees with uh, with that interpretation. So I thought that was really great. And like you said, retinitis pigmentosa could be up to a hundred gene defects. And one doesn't know which one the patient has, but your approach treats a gene early in the pathway of disease so that it corrects the de defective gene at the start of the process and restores the regulation and homeostasis throughout the, the network to improve the patient's outcome. So, you know, that was... That was something that was like science fiction not that long ago. The idea of correcting a single gene was a substantial breakthrough. Correcting a master gene that controls a pathway is really significant. And would this allow you to treat... Well, one of the things in, in the trial that you mentioned was a gene-agnostic approach. And uh, the, could you just elaborate on the arms of the trial and, and the design? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the clinical trial for phase three, um, totally, we have 150 patients. And uh, so they're broken down into two arms. Uh, one of them is a rhodopsin mutations. And because in phase one, two, rhodopsin um, carries about 10 to 12 percent of RP patients. In US, you know, out of 100,000, 10 to 12,000 patients, have rhodopsin mutations, and some of them are autosomal dominant. They're very difficult to treat. And uh, we have, um, you know, good data in our phase one, two. And rhodopsin patients, like you stated, you know, either preserving what they have, also improvement. Uh, when we looked into multiple measures like mobility test, you know, LLVA and BCVA. So in phase three, what we are looking at is first arm is rhodopsin mutations, and the second arm is gene agnostic. That means we'll take patients with RP uh, with a diagnosis and uh, multiple patients can be enrolled into that. It's another uh, 75 patients in each group, totally is 150. And in each group, they'll have an untreated arm in two to one ratio. That means 50 patients are on the treatment, 25 patients are untreated. And the trial duration is one year. And so what we have done by working with FDA, we um, the functional endpoint uh, is very important for these patients. As I mentioned before, they lose their peripheral vision and night vision. So really moving in low light, ability to improve or preserve what they have is really important for these patients. So what we are measuring is 150 patients, two arms, rhodopsin arm and gene agnostic arm. And uh, both the arms are powered very well, more than 90%. And uh, so we're also looking into responder rates in okay. both the arms. OK, it's not just, you know, reaching a mean um, improvement in this mobility test by two levels. Um, it's actually the responder is defined as person, you know, who reaches two levels or more uh, improvement. And we're going to take that responder number from treated group versus untreated group. And we, we have to show statistical superiority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's 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 a that's a actually good way to analyze, you know, some of the, you know, most of the cancer trials, they look at the responder analysis. And that's a, that's a very innovative design, you know, came up with by working closely with FDA. And so, um, so those two groups, that means the gene agnostic group also will have multiple mutations. Anybody who has RP is diagnosed, 
We also have to make sure they meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria to get into the trial. And so, um, um, so the mobility test, we call it now um, luminescence dependent navigation assessment because it's more, it's a, it's a, what we did, we increased the number of um, you know, light levels from phase one to trial um, to more numbers and so that we can go down all the way to 0 0.04 lux level. On the top side, we can go to 500 lux level. So we'll allow patients, you know, somewhere to get into the trial so we can show the improvement because we don't want these patients to be on the edge and they're getting in the trial. So we, we'll be able to show, yeah, can the minimum cross two levels? We want to have that gap. So thanks to FDA uh, by collaborating with us closely and designing this course. And so that's what we have. So that's the primary endpoint to going through this LDNA and responder analysis. Responders are who cross two levels or more. And we're going to compare that with untreated group. So if the both arms give favorable results, then you get a broad gene agnostic RP indication. That's big yeah. for patients because they think then, you know, anybody with RP and uh, they'll be eligible for treatment once we, you know, go through this approval process. Yes, that would be huge for these patients. And you, you mentioned the the European regulators. Uh, what will what will you need to do in addition to this phase three trial for European approval? Uh, for European approval, um, Robert, I think uh, the most important thing. Um, um, is actually aligning with them with our U.S. clinical trial, mm -hmm. which FDA um, and uh, has agreed on, and the Europe uh, first and foremost, since it's a still a large orphan disease, probably uh, this will be the biggest in therapy orphan out there. And once we get there, compared to anything in the market today, and and so with that in mind, uh, since it's orphan in nature, we have a broad RP and LCA orphan indications in Europe too. Um, in fact, they got orphan drug uh, designations. And so based on that, we requested them, can they utilize our US data? So um, to apply for approval and of our market authorization, they have agreed to that. Why? Number one, um, it, it's a tremendous amount of uh, you know resources we need to conduct clinical trials again in Europe and a duplicating effort, resources, time, capital, all these things. And uh, since it's such a significant unmet medical need for these patients, I think uh, thanks to European regulators and uh, they, they have agreed, yep, you can submit the US trial data for European approval. Obviously, in addition to that, you know, um, um, FDA and EMA on the chemistry manufacturing controls, um, we need to um, make sure whatever the requirements are, we need to uh, kind of satisfy those packages in the BLA or market authorization. Sure, okay. but. Yeah, that's a, that's a significant savings in time and expense to be able to do that with the clinical data. Okay, and one of the other things is that if you're using this master control approach, what how does this apply to other diseases? Because it would seem that you could go into many populations and use that same principle of controlling a disease process with many steps rather than just one. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the the next program, you know, it's it's uh, even bigger than RP. Um, you're talking about AMD, you know, taking dry age related macular degeneration. Ten million patients in U.S., two hundred sixty six million global. So in U.S., about ten percent of the dry AMD patients are late stage. That's called geographic atrophy. And that means they have a lesion, what we call it in technical term, it's like blurriness in the central vision. And uh, if a patient is, uh, you know, 60 or around that age, and once they see this and uh, panic starts, because, you know, the hope of living and life, right? And vision is so important for them. Once they say, oh my God, my central vision is blurried, and now it's going to grow, that means I may not be able to do all the functions. I, I may be dependent. I may not be able to see my kids or grandkids. I won't be able to do my things my way, you know, independently. So most of the people who are on the edge, they talk to the patients, you know, whatever they lost, they lost, but they want to keep it what they have. It's so important for them. So the dry AMD, um, the, the, the disease pathology, you know, how it starts, they have four different pathways which can uh, cause, you know, dry AMD or geographic atrophy. 
Uh, one is, you know, starting with oxidative stress and lipid metabolisms, you know, and these um, regulating those pathways, you know, and uh, as we age, you know, there is an issue with these pathways and that's how the disease AMD starts. And then you get a chronic inflammation, then, you know, you get a complement um, system formation at the end. And so it's really important to really treat the core where the disease starts, the oxidative stress and lipid metabolism, how to, you know, regulate this pathway so that, you know, it can control and even ability to reverse. So what we have is another modifier gene, Rora. And uh, so it can regulate all these four pathways and reset it. And uh, that's really important. And uh, we have good data. It's actually on our corporate deck. Uh, there is a slide which shows um, when you give this modifier gene in ABCA4 uh, defective mice, and this, uh, um, just as I mentioned before, when you have a defective gene, you know, certain other genes are also suppressed because of the systemic, you know, um, based on epigenetics. In this case, um, you know, when you have ABCA4 defect, CD59 expression is depressed. And, and this animal models, we show the data. And when you give a Aurora or another modifier gene, OQ410, CD59 expression comes up. Why is CD59 imp uh, important? Because that can prevent the, you know, this complement formation. And so there may be other companies working on, you know, gene therapy approach just for the target. But what is important is really looking at all those four pathways, including, you know, very important on the oxidative stress and lipid metabolism, because, you know, that's where the lesion starts. And so by kind of resetting this regulation, working on all four pathways, very important because this, just like, you know, we have seen in the other gene therapy approach um, for OCU400, in this case, you know, if we can preserve, you know, when they're in this late disease stage, or even, you know, first of all, if you control the disease progression, that's what most of the drugs get approved. There are two products which got approved last year. And, uh, and they control uh, disease progression compared to control in two years, about 30%. So the lesion is still growing, but they control the you know, progression of the disease. And uh, they have to typically give multiple injections per year. And a uh, certain percentage of the patients you know, after treatment uh, are getting neovascularization after two years. And so they also target only one pathway, the complement pathway. Mm -hmm. That's where the differentiator is. And uh, our another master regulator can control all these pathways. It has potential to not only control the disease progression, but preserve what you have. It has potential to even reverse. Time will tell in the clinical trials. And we yeah. also showed in uh, in vivo in vitro data, data you know looking at all four pathways. So I mean the most exciting thing for us is it's a large population. You know when you when you're targeting you know the genetic you know gene therapy approach. Um, uh, to regulate the system and you're going from, you know, large orphan disease, like 100,000, like RP in US to, you know, 1.6 million global to now you're going and in, moving into dry AMD, very, very large. Even, even the 10% of dry AMD in US is like a you know, million patients. And yeah. if we have a therapy rather than giving, you know, six or 12 injections per year, back of the eye, if you give it just a one injection, potential for life. Yeah. And it can work on all four pathways and not only control the disease progression, potential to control, preserve what you have and potentially probably have ability to reverse. That will be phenomenal for patients. So we're very excited about that program. We're currently dosing patients in phase one, two clinical trials. And uh, we are anticipating some efficacy data from that by the end of the year. Preliminary. Yeah. And that will be remarkable, you know. So, I mean, again, the same principle, uh, these master regulators, um, you know, this is going to change the paradigm, how we treat diseases going forward. And, you know, looking at like a large disease burden, you know, most of the time when you have traditional gene therapies, you're targeting rare diseases or ultra rare diseases, you know, targeting a few patients to a few hundred, maybe like a few thousand. You know, nobody is thinking about how do you look at the disease like RP? which is heterogeneous in nature, more than 100 genes. You know, it's impossible for drug companies to develop 100 products. Yes, absolutely. Here we are. And we believe we have a solution for that. You know, that's the first program. And the second yeah. one, you know, going yeah. after patients like, you know, in millions and with a, with a single treatment, potentially for life. And those yeah. are the things we are very excited about. So 
in a nutshell, our gene therapies have potential to target diseases, you know, orphan in nature, really large orphan diseases, to diseases, you know, uh, which run into millions with a, with a potential single, um, you know, dose injection per life per eye. That's it. Yeah, and just to distinguish the different types of age-related macular degeneration, there's the wet form that is due to vascularization of the retina and inappropriate growth of capillaries that causes blindness. Those are currently treated with drugs from Regeneron and Genentech that have billions in annual sales and have injections on a monthly or quarterly or some regular schedule. And that's about 10% of the patients. The other 90% are dry AMD, which as you described, are due to irregularities in lipid metabolism and those four pathways. And that's 90% or about 10 million patients. Uh, it's the most common form of blindness in the elderly and starts with loss of central vision and people stop driving at night and then they gradually lose more and more vision. The GA, the geographic atrophy that you described is the most severe 10%. And these people have areas of dead cells in their retina and dying cells in the retina. But your treatment would be a once, once and done and correct the, the whole pathway and all of the things that are going on that cause this dysregulation and cell death. So you're going to the root cause of the disease. With with a single treatment, yes, wow, that's right. that's very powerful, and that could serve a market of ten million patients. That's right, Robert. It's a, it's a large market, and uh, it's a significant blindness disease, and uh, I mean it's age related, so elderly. Uh, I think it'll be phenomenal hope for these patients. You know, the rescue is on its way, and it's going to take some time. Uh, I, you know, we're doing everything we can. Uh, to move, move this program in phase one to a clinical trial. And uh, by the end of the year, uh, we're anticipating some preliminary results from efficacy and looking into, you know, the lesion, yeah. just like you mentioned. And uh, and from there, you know, we'll move into late stage trials. And that, that's going to be change the paradigm, just like you said. You know, you're not targeting um, small disease burden. It's really important, you know. People really, when you talk to these patients, uh, either it's a orphan disease, RP patients or AMD patients, uh, it's, 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 it's so difficult in the conversations with families and them, you know, for them, uh, even it's an orphan disease, we may think, oh, okay, it's 10,000 or 100,000 for them. It's the whole life, the whole families, you know, yeah. goes through that, you know, is there any rescue anybody can offer to protect what they have? Um, it, it's a, uh, that's the, that's the, you know, we're very excited with these programs and, uh, especially the AMD program as you mentioned, it's going to be big. Yeah, and you know, in terms of the, the patients and their families, these patients lose their ability to see and they lose their independence, whether it's driving or being able to carry on various activities of daily living, like eating and cooking, dressing, and just getting around, they become dependent and require more care and expensive care, which would make a solution like yours cost-effective down the road for the lifetime of the patient. Yes. So the value of such a therapy is enormous. Absolutely. And also the second program, that the same gene, Dorogen targeting dry AMD, it also targets the Stargard disease. And that has got about 40,000 patients in the US. Currently, there are no therapies available for them. They're also desperate for rescue. So we're really going after this. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the things, Robert, I'd like to show, there is a um, um, actually video of a patient who went through our clinical trial for a year, um, you know, rhodopsin patient, which is a tough um, mutations to treat. And uh, as we talked about patients and what their families will go through, and uh, you're, you're going to see this video after one year of treatment. It's really important for audience to see it. The reason is, um, 
as I mentioned before, uh, for them, you know, they're, they're one person in their life, the entire family gets impacted so significantly. And, you know, their independence, just like you mentioned about, you know, and for them, you know, if they go to a restaurant in a, a dim light, if they can walk to their, you know, seat and sit by themselves without anybody's help, that's remarkable. You know, if they're doing it today, they want to keep that way. And, 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 and I think uh, if their ability to walk in their house and, you know, independently and, and, and do their things the way you mentioned it, that's very, very important for them. So I'd like to share that video. And if sure. you can, okay. then, then, then we can talk a little bit after that. And so if you can play that video. Oh, okay, great. Let's go to the video now. I was able to see right here, this movement on my hand. I didn't used to see it. Now I can see the movement. I don't see it clearly, very clearly, but I can see a movement there. And that's <laughs> that change. Sorry. All my life, I knew about this illness. And now I have a hope. Since I was a little boy, I knew about this illness, retinitis pigmentosus, but I never had a problem. I was about 43 years old when my condition started being worse, little by little, taking part of my vision away from me. So what retinitis pigmentosa is actually a whole collection of diseases, each of them caused by different mutation. The most common course of the disease is to begin with night blindness. The second big change is they start losing side vision. 37 years in the postal service, my eye had to be in good shape to be able to do my job. At each of the stages, there's a, a loss, a sense of loss, and sort of a grieving process. Patients have to sort of move on and, and try to adjust to a new set of capabilities. And once they've done that, something else happens, and they have to adjust to, to that. You know, and eventually, you know, I think the last part of the disease, when the all that's left is sort of a central island, uh, and that starts closing in, and they can actually tell from month to month, you know, that it's getting smaller. It's a tough psychological challenge. When you have this and it goes a little bit more, a little bit more, little bit, you don't really realize the situation. They told me about Ecugene. I started the study. They did the surgery. I can see a little bit more in some areas that I, 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 didn't, I didn't used to. You know, it was kind of a dark totally dark. For a lot of people, it's not much. But for me, you know, it's a big step. I don't have to be guided. I don't have to ask to be helped, to be independent in, in a way. I, I'm so thankful for the company and for the doctors and researchers with this study. My hope was to stop the illness and and getting more than that, get information, educate yourself so you can help yourself and help others. That's really powerful. And, you know, when, when you hear about the data and hear about the science and degrees of, of improvement, it all seems like numbers. But when you hear a patient and see the effect that it's had on their lives, it makes it very tangible and very real. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Robert. That's what uh, we are here for, you know, um, really work hard to get these therapies out there, um, potentially in the next couple of years and, you know, start, and we started recruiting in our phase three clinical trial for Hockey 400. Yes. And pretty excited about it. And uh, our goal is to, you know, get ready for, you know, BLA and MAA target, you know, approvals in 2026. And uh, and it's a one year duration, as I mentioned. So we're very excited about it. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, all these patients across the globe 
um, you know, they have a hope. Yes. Dealing with these blindness diseases. Yeah. There, there's, there's, it sounds like there's an effective treatment in the works, which is great. And could you just remind us some of the milestones coming up over the next several months? Yes. First thing is, of course, you know, we're, we're uh, ready with our phase three clinical trial with FDA green light, thanks to FDA. Um, we'll, we'll start recruiting very quickly and we'll continue to provide updates on a phase three OQ400 recruitment. Mm -hmm. And also we'll provide updates on OQ410, targeting geographic atrophy and dry AMD, um, a safety, as well as, you know, some preliminary efficacy by the end of the year, which is going to be uh, big for the company. And then also OQ410 ST targeting Stargard disease will continue to provide updates and uh, also provide some preliminary safety uh, and I mean, efficacy data by the end of the year. And we are providing as we go on, actually both GA trial as well as Stargard trial, um, the low dose is safe and tolerable. So we're in the mid dose right now, we're dosing patients. It's moving quickly. Good. Great. Okay, well, we will be looking forward to those milestones coming up. So thank you, Robert. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you for having me today.